Hello and welcome everybody, this is Alex from Value Insights and this time I have prepared a little video series for you with mock exam questions for the ETL4 Foundation exam. In this slide deck you will find a couple of flashcards which you can click and they will turn around and we will actually walk through those questions and I will explain the answers to you. So let's jump right into it. The first question is, how does the services practice contribute to the engaged service value chain activity? And at this place, I would suggest to pause the video and come back once you have read all the possible answer options. And then I will tell you which one the correct is, and I will explain why that is this case. I know you didn't pause the video. <laughs> nah, just kidding. So let's have a look at the right answer now, which is in this case C. Okay, so it says by coordinating all the activities during the rollout of new applications in A, not true because for that we have release management and deployment management who work in conjunction uh, to achieve this goal. By ensuring that all stakeholders have been engaged in the definition of SLAs, certainly an interesting option, but surely not the service test practice. They might be engaged in the defi uh, definition of SLAs, but it's not their task to coordinate all the activities. That is um, responsibility of service level management. By acting as the main channel for operational engagement with users, that is the correct answer because it's all about engaging with the users at the service desk, right? They call the service desk, they email, they chat, they reach the service desk in any other way. And the main responsibility of the service desk is to answer those operational activities and questions and inquiries um, the users and customers might have. And then D says by providing first level support, which is kind of true, but actually C is even better because it has a broader spectrum, so to say. It's a bigger range than just simply providing first level support for the customers. Question number two, who are the main parties involved in the definition of SLAs or service level agreements? Again, pause the video and we will come back in a sec. The correct answer to this question is A, because the SLAs are defined between service provider and customer. They tell the service provider what levels of service would make our customers satisfied and what we should actually deliver to make them happy. B says customer and vendor, but honestly, most of the times we as a service provider don't care about all the other vendors our customers might have, except if we are involved in service integration management. Then we have answer C, which says vendor and service provider. That is a special contract, also defined in ITIL, but it's called underpinning contract or UC. And then we have IT and business as answer option D, which is, yeah, let's call it internal parties of the same service provider organization. And if they have an agreement between each other, that will be called an OLA, like operational level agreement. Let's have a look at the next question. Why should you utilize a CMDB configuration management database within your organization? Have a look at the options and I'll tell you the answer in a minute. Okay, it wasn't actually a minute. The correct answer is A in this case. It says to get an overview of all your CIs or configuration items and understand their relationships. That is the main goal of the configuration management practice and with it of the configuration management database. You want to know what you have in your organization, you know, all the servers and applications that run on it, the, the uh, services which you have, and also the individual infrastructure elements like routers, switches, or whatnot. Okay, and, and you want to understand how those components work together. B says because there is a regulatory requirement for it. Well, it might be the case, but it's certainly not the main goal. To track all hardware-related incidents. Well, it is an advantage to be able to do this by having a CMDB in place, but it's not the main goal again. And D says to ensure that only approved versions are used when installing software. And that is actually ensured by a special part of the CMDB, which is called DML, Definitive Media Library, which holds all the approved versions of uh, software applications, you know, which then can be pushed to the individual um, workstations and servers when needed. Good. Let's have a look at the next question. The problem management practice is meant to do what exactly? Let's have a look at the options and then I'll tell you the correct answer. The right one for this is C. It says, identify and solve the unknown cause of one or more incidents. Well, that is it by definition. The problem by definition is the unknown cause of one or more incidents and the problem management practice is meant to identify those and solve those problems to make sure they never happen again. And the goal is also to reduce the number of recurring incidents. 
But then if you look at A, reduce the number of problems, that's not a goal. It might sound like it, but it's not. It's, it, the goal is to identify root causes and to make sure that the incidents resulting out of these problems do not reoccur. B says resolve incidents that cannot be solved by the service desk. Certainly not true again, because that is still the incident management practice. It's just other support teams like second level teams or expert teams who are supposed to do exactly this. And then we have D, which says enable expert teams to troubleshoot complex issues. Again, not the case. We don't open a problem ticket just because an incident ticket gets too complex. We open problem tickets if we don't know what is causing these incident tickets. Let's have a look at question number five. Which guiding principle emphasizes the need to understand the flow of work, identify bottlenecks and remove waste? Again, please pause the video and come back once you have the right answer. Let's see if you were right about your answer, because the correct one for this is D. D says collaborate and promote visibility, and that uh, guiding principle certainly has the goal to ensure that whatever blocks our work is made visible, that we have transparency and that we collaborate with other teams and stakeholders to remove those bottlenecks, which will enable us to uh, speed up the flow of work and get results done faster. A says, progress iteratively good feedback, which is one of my favorite guiding principles. Nonetheless, it's not the right one for this because it's more about the baby steps and the continual feedback from our stakeholders. B, start where you are, is all about utilizing what is already in place instead of building or buying everything from zero. You know, so we can make sure that, that we recycle stuff that can still be used. And C says, uh, keep it simple and practical, which speaks for itself. Sure, we shouldn't overdo stuff. We don't need the gold plating, but we barely need um, that what the customer requires. We shouldn't overachieve nor underachieve. But the correct answer for this question is the collaborate and promote visibility. There we go. Let's have a look at question number six. The percentage of successful versus failed changes is an example of what? I assume you paused the video, so let's see the right answer, which in this case is B. It is a key performance indicator or KPI. It's a typical metric which helps us to measure how well our um, um, practices are actually working. The first one says a practice success factor, which is more like uh, an overarching goal that our practice needs to achieve, but it's not an individual metric. A performance goal is something completely different and not even defined in ITIR like that. And the critical success factor is the old name of practice success factors, right? So the correct one here is a KPI. Reusing resources, if possible, is a recommendation of which guiding principle? Let's have a look at these options and then I'll tell you the correct answer in a sec. And the correct one for this is A. It says start where you are. I think on the previous slide we have already talked about this. Start where you are is all about making sure that whatever we have already in place is somehow utilized again if possible. Just because we are installing a new application doesn't mean we need to buy everything. Maybe we already have some servers available or maybe we have some um, you know, human resources available which would help us install that application on those servers and configure those. So we don't need to start from zero. That's the message of this guiding principle. Focus on value says that we should understand our stakeholders and what is important to our stakeholders. Keep it simple and practical says we shouldn't overachieve and we shouldn't overdo, but simply achieve what is needed by our customers and stakeholders. D says optimize and automate. And the main message here is that we should automate whatever is possible in an economical manner to maximize the value of human work. You know, whatever can be automated should be automated because then we can invest our own time um, into more um, value focused activities. Let's have a look at our next question, which is what is the perceived benefit, usefulness and importance of something? I suggest to pause the video and I'll check back in a minute on you. The correct answer for this question is D. It is value. A service, uh, services are the means of enabling value co-creation with our customers. A practice is a configuration of resources that is somehow transforming input into output. And utility is part of the value. It is actually telling us how useful a service is. But it's not the only part. And value is 
the perceived benefits. And I like to highlight the fact that it says perceived benefits because you can have the best utility and you can have the best warranty, which is another part of what value is. But it's also about the perception of your customers. If they have a bad feeling or if they think badly or if they have bad experiences with your service, besides that, then you will have a hard time. Good. So let's have a look at the next one. Moving configurations from one environment to the next is done by which practice? Again, I'll be back in a sec. The correct answer for this question is B, deployment management. Because A, release management is re responsible for the coordination of the activities that are needed to um, make services available for customers and users. This may include also the movement of uh, configuration from one environment to the next, but it's only the coordination that is done, not the doing itself, because that is deployment management. Configuration makes sure, I mean, configuration management makes sure that we have a CMDB in place, that we understand what configuration items we have and how they connect to each other. And then we have asset management, which considers the financial impact of our IT assets. So we have arrived at our last question in this video, which says, how does the service request practice contribute to the obtained build service value chain activity? Let's take a minute again, pause the video, and I'll come back with the right answer in a minute. The correct one for this is C. Let's see why that is the case. A says delivery of support via the service test practice. Not true because as said, that would be the service test practice and not the service request practice. So that's closed out. B says management of all predefined standard changes. Well, the service request practice kind of does that, but honestly, it doesn't do it in the obtain and build service value chain activity, rather in the deliver and support. And then we have D, which says correct categorization of service request tickets. Again, same as before, it's done this in the uh, deliver and support service value chain activity. So the correct one here is C, the acquisition of pre-approved service components may be fulfilled through service requests. This means that whenever we need to, let's say, buy something to, to build and configure our service or our products, and for this, we need some kind of predefined standard items, let's say like laptops or phones or something like that. Then we could open service requests for this and get them uh, done by the service request practice instead of um, opening changes, which need to go through the usual change approval procedure. And therefore, the correct answer here is C again. Thank you very much for watching this video. We have arrived at the end of it. I hope you found it helpful and that you liked it. If so, please give it a thumbs up and maybe you want to also subscribe to our channel so we can keep you posted on our next videos because this was just the first one and the second one will follow soon. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave us a comment below the video or go to our webpage, have a chat with us, or you can also reach us on social media or send us an email. Again, thank you very much for watching and see you around in the next video.